The scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 17, verses 20 to 33. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or There it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, There he is, or Here he is, do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage all up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. This is God's word. Thanks, Ryan. Sometime in the fall of 2008, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation to give to my parents on why I should be allowed to get a Facebook. And my Facebook, while I'm no longer active, is still live, and it is truly a treasure trove of cell phones, including this status, which I posted in 2009 when I was going into ninth grade. Dad, it's a lapse in character not to make your bed. And our family friend who commented, oh, that's what's wrong with our family. A lapse in character, I knew it was something simple like that. We can unpack the ways that I had to unlearn my association with morality and common household tasks another time. My dad always says you have to be in therapy for something. Start the fund early. But this idea of how to form the character of a child or a person is something that we think about a lot. I'm a former teacher, something we talk about in school, something parents are thinking about, something we're all thinking about about our own lives. How do we build these habits of responsibility and honesty and respectfulness? We're in a series called Intersections. We're studying the way that faith interacts with all aspects of human life and fundamentally informs and changes them. And this morning's intersection we're going to talk about is faith and character. We're going to connect this kind of more broad, commonly used and talked about idea of character with the more like churchy term, the kingdom of God. And I want to state right at the top in the passage that we read today, there's a lot of end of the world, second coming, what theologians call eschatology. And we're not really going to get too much into that. I left it in there for a reason, but... We're not, we're not going to touch that as deeply today. We're going to talk about how what Jesus is talking about in this passage uh, means for the way that our character develops. Okay, so growing up, I had a Bible teacher in elementary school, Miss Russell, and she made us memorize all sorts of scripture and facts about the Bible. And one of the phrases that she had us memorize and recite regularly was one that I'm sure some of you also memorized as children, which is watch your thoughts they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. This passage from Luke has all of that. It has the internal world of the believer, the nature of the way we interact with each other in our communities that we live in, the future of the world, and the nature of God and Jesus on whom all of our characters are modeled. Our character is built on both these individual and communal bases, and we're going to talk about both today. But the anchor verse in this passage for understanding how our faith and character intersect is verse 21, where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. That verse is potentially, we could understand, 
one of the many metaphors that Jesus uses to talk about the kingdom of God. He uses a million parables. He talks about the kingdom of God being a seed sower, a mustard seed, a hidden treasure, yeast and dough. And his constant reaching for metaphors hints at the truth that the kingdom of God is a bit of a nebulous concept. It's a little hard to pin down. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God cannot be observed, he's saying the kingdom of God is not something you can observe with your five senses, the way that you could look at someone's hair color or their running ability. And our characters are very much the same. The kingdom of God is this ambiguous concept. Our characters are also kind of an ambiguous concept, not something that can be measured in the speed that it takes you to run 100 meters. So how do we understand it? How do we measure and therefore inform how we approach our characters? I think that if we are believers, that the kingdom of God and, the, and, and specifically the way kingdom of God is talked about in this passage forms almost the context or like the playground for our characters to grow. So our characters are living in, growing, developing in all the same places that the kingdom of God is existing. So I wanna hone in on three possible interpretations of that statement that Jesus makes that the kingdom of God is in your midst. The first could be his own body standing in the midst of the disciples, his own person. The second might be the community of believers, right? The disciples and the, even the Jewish teachers who he's addressing in this conversation who are all reflecting the character of a triune God. And then thirdly, each believer's soul which would be indwelt by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So looking at that first interpretation, the person of Jesus. When I read Jesus saying that the kingdom of God is in your midst, it makes me think of another passage from another gospel, the gospel of John. Jesus is going into the temple near Passover and he sees that the temple is full of people selling animals to use for sacrifices, no doubt at a surcharge, no doubt promising greater favor with God the more they spend. And he kind of goes off on these people. He flips some tables, he's yelling, you know, this is my father's house, this is not a market. So the Jewish leaders, understandably, you know, want to kind of address this behavior with him. And so the Jewish leaders asked him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? And Jesus answered them, when you destroy this temple, I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, are you gonna raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus had spoken about was his body. His disciples later remembered what he had said. That was after he had been raised from the dead. Then they believed in the scripture. They also believed in the words Jesus had spoken. Now, you hear John explaining the metaphor that Jesus uses, but also notice the timeline of their understanding. In the moment when Jesus says, when you destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days, it's entirely likely the disciples were just as confused as the Jewish leaders, right? It's later after they have witnessed his death on the cross and his resurrection after three days, that the meaning of his metaphorical language comes clear. They didn't or couldn't understand the metaphor until the metaphor became reality, when Jesus' words became embodied, risen flesh. It's very comforting to me always when I'm trying to study scripture and understand and unpack its meaning that even the disciples who had a front row seat to Jesus are taking their time in coming to an understanding of of, of what he means. So we have Jesus speaking metaphorically about himself in this passage, connecting himself with the temple of God. So it makes sense that in our passage today in Luke, that he might also be, at least in part, referencing himself in their midst as as part of the kingdom of God. But how, how are those two ideas connected? How is the person of Jesus in the kingdom of God related? It's not a direct equivalency. Pastor Kirby Clement Sr. says, Jesus and the kingdom of God are distinct, but inseparable. It is Jesus, the king of God's kingdom, who defines the kingdom and demonstrates its principles and power. Jesus is part of this triune God, three-person God, in whom each human being is made, or in whose image each person is made. And so, in many ways, the embodied person of Jesus is like the perfect human character that all of our characters we hope to emulate. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit that came in to dwell in each of us or, and is accessible to each of us, it's also this power beyond us that, that we don't have in our own flesh but that can work through us and that we can be vessels for. But it, it remains distinct from the fallen world that we inhabit and which we are also part of. 
And so it, because, of, because of this possibility, because of this model that we have of Jesus, of a, someone who suffered perfectly, right, endured everything that was thrown at him with love and kindness and, and, and never sinning, it can make me, when I view the very imperfect way that I endure my own suffering, it, it can make me feel discouraged. Like, how often do I do anything pure-heartedly? Like, not just my suffering, but even the kind things I do. How, how often am I really doing that with no sense of what it can get me? Even if it's just like the ego boost of knowing that I did something nice, you know? But that kind of comparison and really still self-absorption is like an anvil dragging me down. Instead, I think, to truly worship and celebrate and begin to experience the joy in the person of Jesus, we have to kind of let go of that self-absorption, self-flagellation, and just delight in the person of Jesus. My friend talks about this idea of making playful mistakes with God, like finding a way to view your own humanity in the light of his presence and his perfection, his love for us, that, that, that can lead you to laugh and release rather than to cling and, and beat yourself up for it. Our relationship with the person of Jesus takes physical shape and is often revealed in the way that we connect with each other. So let's look at the second interpretation of Jesus' statement, that the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is also in the community of believers. One summer, I interned for the governor's office in the state of Tennessee, and one of my job was to take calls from constituents and listen to their issues and try to connect them with the department that could help them. And one time, I, I, well, one of the things that would happen a lot is people would call about things that were governed by local government jurisdiction and that the state didn't have any power to impact. And so I got a call one day from a woman and pretty quickly, she was telling me about her issue and pretty quickly I realized it was a local, local problem that the state couldn't, couldn't have any, any jurisdiction over. And so I told her that, you know, I said, oh, I kind of interrupted her. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, state doesn't run that. I, we can't, can't really help you. And she just goes, will you just listen to my story? And it kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I just said, yes. And so she talked, I mean, probably for about 10 minutes, just talked. And I listened and said, yeah, mm, like, I'm so sorry, that's so hard. And got to the end of, of her story and she said, thank you, I love you. <laughs> and I said, I love you too. <laughs> and she hung up. <laughs> and I've never forgotten it. It was this beautiful moment where, because I couldn't solve her immediate problem, I thought there was no way for me to help. But because she had the fortitude to interrupt my busy activity and say, will you listen to my story? She offered me the chance to help and created a moment that moved me deeply and that I hope moved her too. Andrew Peterson writes, the steady resonance of your work might move someone closer to the kingdom. And compared to a human heart, planets are small potatoes. We all have ways of caring for each other, serving in our community that come naturally to us. And we often will never see the fruit of our small daily acts of love and labor. And we might not always recognize the small daily acts of love and labor that look different from ours. We don't always recognize the gifts of people who serve differently from us. But as Paul writes in Corinthians, every part of the body of Christ, of the kingdom of God, is necessary, different and necessary. Each human soul reflects something about the character of God, and thus each soul has something to teach us about who God is. The kingdom of God lives in each of our characters, in each of our souls. Here's where we get into the real application part of the sermon today. So, so far we've talked about, okay, the kingdom of God is modeled on and embodied in the person of Jesus. It's also bound up in the community of believers and both can be sources of goodness and truth and beauty to each of us individually. So how does that impact our personal character development? If we accept the proposal that the kingdom of God is connected to this biblical, or the biblical idea of the kingdom of God is connected to the social idea of our character development, what keeps us from participating in and receiving the goodness and beauty and truth of the kingdom of God? I think perhaps the largest obstacle to our character development is lack of insight. Humans often misperceive both ourselves 
and reality. If I speak harshly to my brother, as I sometimes do in a moment of stress, if I come back and say, ugh, that is just not how I should have communicated, I'm sorry, that's one thing. But if I have a pattern of speaking condescendingly and not only deny when I'm confronted with it, deny that that's a problem, but even have a, the inability to perceive the harm that I'm causing, that really hampers my ability to grow and develop. How, how can there be repair without recognition, without insight? We'd all like to think that we are good at perceiving ourselves clearly and reality clearly, but we know from scripture that humans are notoriously poor at perceiving themselves and perceiving reality accurately. The disciples are a great example, as we talked about before, front row seat to Jesus's miracles, and yet often confused and needing more proof of the truth of what he said about himself. Many of the Old Testament men who are called righteous by New Testament writers were deeply flawed and fallen people. Abraham, right, who abused Hagar in pursuit of trying to force a fulfillment of God's promise to him. David, who committed murder and assault to fulfill his desires. Lot, who we're gonna talk about next, who offered up his daughters to appease a crowd. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story of Lot, which is referenced by Jesus in our passage today, I wanna to give you kind of a quick rundown of who Lot was and his story. So Abraham and Lot are uncle and, and nephew. Abraham is one of the patriarchs of the Jewish faith, the man with whom God made his covenant. Abraham and Lot, their groups had some disputes that they couldn't resolve. And so Lot moved away to live in the city of Sodom, of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And these cities were notoriously difficult places to live and full of bad behavior. And it got so bad to the point that God decided to destroy the cities. So Jesus is referencing this story in our passage. He says, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. This is kind of a wild and difficult proposition. And we could, I would love to discuss after this how we kind of square the idea of a God who loves us with a God that we fear, right? That there's a lot to unpack there. But we're just gonna put a pin in that for now and kind of continue with this, this story of what since we happened to Lot. We have this scenario where God was gonna destroy the city, but Abraham intervened. He pleaded on Lot's behalf. He said, please save my, my nephew Lot and his family. If you can find even just a right, one righteous man, please spare them. And so God agrees. He sends these angels into the city to protect Lot and his family, to get them out before the destruction. The people of the town try to attack the angels and Lot asks them not to and offers his daughters to them instead. Fortunately, the angels prevent this and pr protect the daughters, protect the whole family and get them, all, get them all out of there. And as they flee, the angels tell them, do not look back. Do not look back on the destruction of this city. The Lord will carry you to safety. So they are running across the plain. And you know, so somewhere across the plain, the, f the fire and the destruction begins behind them. Fire is raining down from heaven and Lot's wife does look back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. That's the story. In interpreting it, overall, Lot has gotten a pretty favorable treatment, both by New Testament writers and by Christian preachers since. Peter writes, you know, a disciple of Jesus uses Lot as an example of a righteous man in one of his letters, despite his mistakes, his sinful actions. And interpreters, commentators have followed his lead pretty much since then. Conversely, the story of Lot's wife is often held up as an example of an unrighteous person, of what happens when you choose sin over God. And part of the reason for that is what Jesus says. In his next line, he says, remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. People read that and say, oh, remember Lot's wife. Like it's almost a threat, like don't be so enamored with sin that you turn away from God. And that is 100% there. I'm not, that, that is 100% there in this story. But I'm, I'm not sure that it is all that Jesus means or wants us to hear when he says, remember Lot's wife. I want to see if we can offer Lot's wife a more nuanced and holistic reading. So let's take a second, step into her shoes and see from her perspective. Lot's wife, who is not named in scripture, 
but who is called Edith or Edith in older Jewish texts, was not herself a Hebrew. She was living in Sodom when Lot arrived and she was given in marriage to him. We don't know how that happened. Lot would have been a foreigner, so we assume Lot must have had some wealth in order to have access to a woman of her status who is described as being very beautiful and in high demand. And she has four daughters with Lot. The older two are married when the story that Jesus references happens. And it is only the younger two who are with Lot and his wife when they flee the city. As I was studying Lot's wife and thinking about her experiences growing up and what she must have seen and how, well, the question arose for me, did she really know the Hebrew God? We don't know how much Lot taught her about the Hebrew God. And if she didn't, what reason would she have had to think that these strange men, these angels, but these strange men that showed up at her house have her best interests at heart? We know that she was a mother in a city where women were routinely mistreated. We know that she witnessed her husband offer her daughters to a mob. We know that she was asked to leave her home and to leave two of her children behind. Think about that. She's running across the plains knowing she's left two of her daughters behind and she hears the destruction begin. Maybe she had tried to get them word to leave with the family. Maybe her, their husbands had not let them go. Maybe she cherished the hope that they had somehow made it out of the city before the destruction started. Maybe the prospect of the life ahead of her, wandering in the wilderness after the loss of two of her children, made her willing to take her chances and look back. How could we not empathize with a woman in this situation? I think if we're able to look at the story of Lot's wife and see a really black and white picture of what happens to someone who is not holy enough, we really need to stop and maybe look in a mirror. One of the features of the landscape around the Dead Sea where Sodom and Gomorrah is thought to have been, these cities are thought to have been, are these structures that look like rock but are mostly salt. The Dead Sea, as you know, is heavily saturated with salt. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. And it permeates the land around it as well. And there's a particular formation of salt in Jordan that is known as Lot's Wife. It's a destination, it's a pilgrimage destination for a lot of people. And something about this image is so striking to me in the context of the story of Lot's wife. Regardless of whether you know, this is a literal remains of a woman turned into salt by God is not the point. When I see this image, the way that it's taken from this angle, it, 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 this pillar looks like a guardian of sorts over the sea, like an Ebenezer, a marking of God's power and his presence, a reminder to travelers of the power of God, a legacy even of a woman whose life was lost and is now preserved in salt. Scholar Valerie Miles Tribble writes, the lived experiences of Lot's wife give voice to what must be retold in the symbolism of a salt pillar, which Christ later taught had life altering properties. Her vilification ends here, enough. Jesus did talk about salt. He says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. That's a little bit of an odd phrasing, but one interpretation would be, if, if, if you can imagine, the salt around the Dead Sea is not particularly pure. It's mixed in with a lot of dirt and other minerals and debris. You couldn't use it to preserve meat the way that you could pure salt. And that's what Jesus is saying, be pure hearted in your pursuit of me, of each other, of the kingdom of God. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It's one of those rhetorical examples of the gap between what we are called to and what we on our own power are able to achieve. You and I know that not a single one of us in here is perfect. I suggest that as readers, we can view Lot's wife as a fellow traveler who chose maybe even good things over the ultimate. What was Lot's wife's error? She longed for things that she was asked to leave, as so many of us do. She was forced to flee her home, even abandoning her own daughters in the process. And her grief and fear must have been debilitating. And without the insight to know that she was protected by God, chosen by him to survive, she turned back for the comfort of what was behind her. What stands between us and the kingdom of heaven, 
is anything that we cling to instead of God, even and including the best things, the best desires of our heart, when we make them more important than God. There's beauty and value and goodness in the rhythms of life of eating and drinking and building and marrying, and they are not our ultimate purpose. We cannot want anything more than the heart of God, even the very best that the world has to offer. Frederick Beekner writes, the kingdom of God in the sense of holiness, goodness, beauty, is as close as breathing and is crying out to be born both within ourselves and within the world. The kingdom of God is what we hunger for above all other things, even when we don't know its name or realize that it's what we're starving to death for. One of the reasons I left all that second coming language in, in the passage today is it helps us understand what's at stake when Jesus says, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, but whoever loses it will preserve it. And of course, it was Jesus who fulfilled his own statement, who offered the ultimate example of that kind of sacrifice when he died on a cross, surrendered to death, and overcame it in his resurrection three days later to open the door for us to the kingdom of God, for each of our souls to enter into direct communion with him together as a community of believers. Jesus has conquered death and thus has preserved eternal life for us with him. While we live, our individual choices impact our characters, but let us turn our eyes on Jesus, who is the one true perfect character who can help us and invites us now to experience with him the fullness of life and joy in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love for each of us. Thank you for your loving sacrifice that makes it possible for us to enter into, to participate in, to receive the goodness of your kingdom here on earth and to believe in the promise of your kingdom to come. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.